afternoon, everybody. Uh, if you're at the previous session, then welcome back. If you're new to this, then welcome. Mm -hmm. My name is Ant Rogers, and I'm the Biodiversity Implementation Officer for the Pembrokeshire Nature Partnership, just introducing this next session. We've had a fascinating afternoon talking about tracking biodiversity, distribution, and trends. And we're going to move on now to um, a workshop on eco-literacy. Um, just to familiarise you with things, uh, there's a question, uh, sorry, a chat function. Uh, you can type any questions that you have for for Claire and Rodri uh, into the chat as they go, and then uh, a facilitator, Karen LaRue, will try and pick those up, and once the presentation is finished, try and you know, fire them back at uh, Claire and Rodri so that uh, your questions get answered, hopefully. So feel free to type away questions, comments, anything you want to put in the chat there. Um, if you revisit the main platform page, there is uh, the facility to give feedback on this and other sessions, and that would be really appreciated by the organisers if they can have some feedback. Uh, to remind you that sessions are being recorded as well. They'll be available afterwards on the WBP conference page website. And just a final reminder then, it's your last chance to uh, to get yourself in to the social networking quiz at six o'clock. If you're socially minded, then uh, get into that and have a laugh and uh, network with a few people. Six o'clock details are on the main platform page as well. So that's enough of me. Uh, we'll move straight over now to Claire Thaylerberry and Rodney Thomas of uh, Clanar Cymru. Um, to give you the workshop on eco-literacy. Over to you, Dean. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Ant. Okay. Hello, everyone, um, and thank you for joining this workshop, especially at the end of the day. We have an hour scheduled, but we might not need all that time. We'll see how we go. So this session is about considering how we apply lessons from the climate crisis to the nature emergency, and specifically whether the guiding principles and methodology of the Carbon Literacy Project can be applied to encourage and bring about greater participation in action on the nature emergency. Before we begin, I'll just introduce myself and Rodri and our organisation, Penel Cymru, and then we'll move on to talking about um, what we're calling, for want of a better word, our eco-literacy project. So we have a few slides to go through, um, but then we'll be happy to take questions, so if you post them in the chat. Uh, there might be an option to make it a bit more interactive with mics later on, but I think that depends on numbers. Okay. So my name is Claire, and this is uh, my colleague, Rodri. We both work for Panel Cymru, Sustain Wales, which is a small Welsh sustainable development charity. So that's the team. There are only five of us, um, and our work focuses mainly on decarbonisation, fair work, and increasingly the nature emergency. We exist to accelerate progress towards a sustainable future. And as a charity working for you know, a sustainable future for the planet, we felt that the nature emergency really needs a bit more of our time and attention. So my background is actually in community development. Um, and I know some of you from LNP Cymru or Environment Wales days. Rodri is also trained in ecology and taught ecology at university level. So for both of us, the natural environment has been a strong motivator, and we've always tried to bring that into our wider work, but now really is the time where we think we need to give it more prominence. And we started our journey about thinking how we can apply our particular strengths and skills to that. You know, Cardinal Cymru is a sort of action-focused charity. We're a membership body. We tend to work with our members to help people do what they do in ways that don't exploit the planet or other people um, and try and draw out better ways of doing things that have as many benefits as possible. But we're not a think tank, we're not a policy body, we're not specialist advisors for government or anything like that. So we needed to think what particular expertise we could bring to this. And I suppose we have a background in behaviour change um, and encouraging people to identify actions that they themselves can take. So we know that the reasons that we've ignored the nature crisis for so long, despite the years of evidence that are available, are pretty similar to the reasons that we've also ignored the climate crisis and why it took so long um, for there to be widespread consensus that you know, big concerted global action was necessary. So we're now at this point where the level of global cooperation and action that is necessary to avoid the worst sort of consequences of impending climate change is going to absolutely dwarf anything that we've seen so far for the current pandemic as this 
cartoon from the Economist shows, which you might have seen, and we know that the nature emergency is just around the corner. So thinking about where we've had successes in encouraging action on climate change, we want to know if we can try to do the same thing for the ecological crisis as well. So our main success has been through the Carbon Literacy Project, and Rodri is now going to explain that to you now. Um, so the climate crisis and the ecological nature crisis have many things in common, and of course they overlap and reinforce each other. One of the key things that they have in common is that they are both what um, Paul Allen from the Centre for Alternative Technology calls wicked problems. In other words, they're complex systems level problems, or their causes are complex and systems level. Their solutions are going to be complex and systems level as well. But coupled with this complexity is that we uh, we don't have the software, the means up here to deal with these complex situations. So what you're looking at on the slide now is a repre representation of the work of George Marshall. And some of you may know George. He lives in Llanid Lois. He's been a public speaker in, in Wales now for many years. Um, and he's worked a lot with Lorraine Whitmarsh and Adam Corner, Stuart Capstigan, the founder of the Climate Outreach Organization. When you're looking at it in the cover of one of his books, um, don't even think about it. And I've pulled out so, uh, uh, on the right there, I've got, pulled out a list of things that he touches on in greater detail in the book. And uh, in essence, what we're talking about here is that modern human beings are walking around with brains that haven't evolved massively fundamentally core from the age of hunter-gatherers. So take, for example, um, follow the crowd. As a hunter-gatherer, you're going to be a lot more successful, pass your genes on to the next generation, if you work as a team rather than if you go off on your own. Um, can't see slow moving threats. We're evolved to deal with tigers leaping out at us or you know, an angry cave bear or something, but not things that occur over decades. Um, so in essence this is the problem this is you know this compounds the problem of what is already a complicated thing anyway. So along comes carbon literacy which is an attempt to give individuals agency in response to this complex problem, to get around the things that George is talking about. And because the two problems are similar, we think that the solution to one is a solution, a tool in the fight to solve the one. It's also a tool in the fight to solve the other. So talk about carbon literacy. What is carbon literacy? Okay, a climate awareness solution, it's, and it is successful. So the people who created carbon literacy, that's their definition on the screen now. That. And how it came about was that um, in Manchester, around about 2010, um, cross-sector group of organizations, business, public sector, community level, the key, the universities, which are key to all this, because there's some big important universities in Manchester. All these people came together uh, in a kind of creative commons uh, crowdsourcing ethos, and they developed a carbon reduction plan for Manchester, which you can find on the internet. There's a plan, there's a target of zero carbon Manchester by 2038. It's no mean feat that all these people came together willingly, without you know, money, uh, and developed this uh, collaboratively. Having developed the plan, they then realized the plan is no good without the people to implement it. It's all very well a group of elite eggheads knowing about this plan. What about everyone who, in their words, lives, works, and studies in Manchester, Greater Manchester? It's a lot of people. So again, they put their heads together, and we're talking about, you know, educational experts, climate experts, uh, 
public engagement experts, to all the resources that a city the size of Manchester could bring to bear on a problem. Together they came up with this idea of carbon literacy, and they developed pilot courses. Um, it's been hugely successful, and it's gone way beyond the boundaries of Manchester. Canol Cymru is the official partner of carbon literacy in Wales. You can see there is 10 nations engaged, of which Wales is one of those 10. But, you know, the mayor of Amsterdam, uh, he's done carbon literacy. Uh, senior public figures in Manchester have done it. The BBC, Salford Keys, you know, it's big, big uh, BBC headquarters in Manchester. They have done it literally in their thousands, and it's because of carbon literacy that has been an BBC editorial policy not to give climate change deniers a platform anymore. So no more Nigel Lawson talking rubbish on the Today programme on Radio 4. This is all a consequence of carbon literacy. And um, in the bottom right-hand corner there, you can see 5 to 50 percent carbon savings. That comes from uh, Jacobs, the engineering firm, their Manchester office did carbon literacy through their staff, and they did uh, an evaluation study, and that is their estimate of the savings that came about because of the process. I asked if I... Uh, yeah, so actually there are now more citizens than when I first got a hold of this slide. It's going up all the time. I myself have trained over 400 people in carbon literacy. So it's tr incredibly successful. So let's have a look in more detail about what it is. Now, they did write some pilot courses in the beginning, but the important thing to understand with carbon literacy is not that there's a bunch of people in Manchester churning out courses for the likes of me and you to use. I wrote my own course. You could write your own course. Why we get to call it carbon literacy is because our courses uh, are coherent with the carbon literacy standard. And in Manchester, you have the Carbon Literacy Foundation, uh, no, the Carbon Literacy Trust, and the Carbon Literacy Project, and the project is the kind of business end. And what you do is you design a course, you send in your materials, your lesson plan, and you send it off to Manchester, and they tell you whether you are about to teach carbon literacy, so you can carry their logo. And what they're looking for, it's a day's worth of learning, so around about six to eight hours worth of learning. Could be spread over a week, could be chunked up any way that suits the, the delivery. Local or social learning. So this is climate change explained in the context of who you are. So we could provide carbon literacy to teenage mothers on a housing estate in Bertha or chief executives of Fortune 500 companies. Or, you know, the NAS tackle act of climate. I'm no expert in this, but top CEOs like Richard Branson or a teenage mother on a, on a housing estate or anyone can do carbon literacy because the learning is contextualized to where they are at. And ideally, it should be delivered by people like them, delivery by peers. So, by and large, I have delivered to my peers, professional people generally with A level or higher education. Um, group inquiry, a very important aspect of adult learning anyway, um, and certainly an important part of carbon literacy, because when you show people things like the temperature sequence, 1884 to the present day, and you see the colors go from blue to deep red, things like that, when you see the wildfires, there's a big emotional impact to finding out just how bad the climate crisis is. You don't want to leave people with the, the uh, paralysis of despair. So carbon literacy has to be about positivity. And it's about, it's action focused. So it's about the locus of control. So if you are a teenage mother on a housing estate in Merthyr, there are things you can do. They're going to be a lot less impactful globally than the chief executive of, uh, of Boots or whatever. You know? But it's everyone can do something. That's the ethos behind. That's what carbon literacy is, and we think we can apply this to um, nature crisis. And just want to acknowledge, given who the audience is and what this conference is, I certainly, and, I'm, and I know a lot of carbon literacy trainers, certainly um, 
that brings the crossover between the climate crisis and the ecological crisis. And this is a slide from in my carbon literacy session where I talk about the migration of species northwards, the uh, ability of um, subarctic species to adapt to less snow cover, uh, the impact on, on species that emerge with day length or change their behaviors with day length, not necessarily on temperature, and species who emerge when you get a warm spike, say in February, and they don't emerge too soon. Cooler waters, migrations, all of that. So we talk about that. It's not like they, they're not, they are totally overlapping, we know that. What's next? So, Claire. Mute. I can't hear you anyway. Okay, so taking those principles that Rodri's explained um, and the success of carbon literacy, we have developed a science based program that is geared around individual agency and responsibility and motivation um, to encourage the same sorts of outcomes for biodiversity. So these are the course aims. So I apologise it's such a wordy slide. I'd normally animate it or have lovely transitions, but um, I just wanted it to be as easy and accessible as possible. So just take a moment to read through those, and I'll explain why we've chosen those different um, categories or, or that sort of journey to take people through. I can... I can see on my screen that some uh, some of the sentences have dropped letters. They were there in the original, I promise. <laughs> we can spell. Okay, so in terms of eco-literacy, we understand, you know, people do degree courses and masters in this sort of thing. We're not trying to turn anyone into an ecological expert, but we're trying to distill down the fundamentals uh, to give people enough of an understanding about how they rely on nature and how their choices can impact it for better or worse. So what we, what we will look at, obviously, nature and us. How, how we rely on ecosystem services uh, and what happens when they decline, as they are declining now. We also want to give people an idea of, of the science behind this, you know, what is an ecosystem? Because many people, it's not, it's not a natural conversation, it's not the things we talk about every day and it's, it's nothing that we hear in Coronation Street or, or anything like that. So we go through the science. And then what's happening to global ecosystems now? So the last thing we want is a whole range of sort of ecology deniers in the same way that we had climate skeptics that just slowed everything down for years and years. So we know, we know that ecosystems are changing and we're going to explain how we know this as well. So there are really credible sources um, and we're using it best and NASA and other UN agencies and the leading um, conservation organisations as well. We're focusing on the key drivers of change that it best identifies. We're also looking at whether nature can be restored. We want to look at what's happening nationally and internationally as well, because I think it would just be great if it best was as well known as the IPCC. Um, and, you know, NRAP did feature in every policy discussion and, and decision. But we also, in that sense of positivity, because when you go through all the drivers of biodiversity loss, it's really, it is really depressing. Um, and that paralysis uh, of fear and despair that Rodri mentioned, we don't want people to think that this is an, an insolvable problem. It's not like we don't know what to do. There, there are great strategies, there are, there are experts and conservationists working on this, so it's not like we don't know what needs to be done, um, but there does need to be more, more focus and more action. So we'll look at success stories and also campaigns and groups that are doing things, so where people feel a natural affinity with things and there's, there's somewhere to point them point them to, to go further. We really want to reiterate that people can make a difference. I mean, the difference in the impact people have will be 
will be different, but that's not important. Every action does count and every choice counts. And in line with, with um, that principle of getting more people on board and modelling social norms and making talking about biodiversity loss, not something that's done by, by geeks in the corner, you know, but just a natural part of conversation in the way that climate change is slowly becoming, um, we want to encourage people and help equip them and feel confident to talk about this to others. And then down at the bottom is our just trainer speak. So we, you know, we're using a range of training methods, group exercises, individual exercises, reflection. You know, with the output being this action plan, individual or organisational level of what people feel is within their control to act on. Can I just point something out? on the action plan, Claire. I forgot to say in carbon literacy that at the end of the carbon literacy course, everybody fills in uh, a three question form. And they say, what are you going to do? And why is it important? And they, the people in Manchester will send these back and say, look, changing your light bulbs, come on, what have you been doing for this day's work? Of work? You know you've got to go further than that. So there is a, it's not just a kind of do the course, forget about it. There is a kind of interaction there golden prompting people, supporting people to, to go further and take real action. So we want to replicate that. That's the whole idea of the action plan. Yeah, and we will, as Roger said, we'll be offering support with that. So where we're at now, so we have talked about this concept for months and months and months. Um, We've sort of uh, concept tested it with NRW, with the Welsh Government and a few other folk. We've discussed it with the Carbon Literacy Trust and we've had their blessing to adapt the carbon literacy methodology because after all it's their sort of intellectual property. Um, and now Welsh Government and Karen's team has kindly agreed to support us um, to take it to the next stage and that means we need to finalise it. We really need to make sure that what we're saying reflects the most up-to-date and the best science and we want to road test it and pilot it with different audiences to see if it's going to have the effect that we, we are hoping for. And this is where we would really appreciate some help. So as I said, we, we're taking um, our content from what we think are really credible sources, but we know you know, we are, we're not experts, we don't work in this day in, day out, um, as many as you do. There are bound to be things that we've missed. There may well be some emerging issue that you would like um, promoted or you think is particularly relevant that we may not have picked up on. Um, sourcing copyright-free images is enormously time-consuming and visual imagery is so powerful in learning um, that perhaps there are some of those that can help demonstrate some of the real challenges facing biodiversity at the moment that you might be happy to help us with. And we would really like um, to identify some non-biodiversity audiences uh, that could help pilot and improve this. So obviously this sort of course is not really geared towards, towards any of you or, or um, your audience because you live and breathe it, it's already in your in your blood and at the heart of your decision making, but we want to reach people who perhaps don't have the same affinity and maybe haven't thought about it so much. So if you have colleagues that work in finance or in hospitality or planning or transport or any of those areas that you think might be interested in, in being part of a little guinea pig group or if you yourselves are interested in seeing more about what we're doing um, and would like to get more involved, we would be very happy to hear from you. Multiple okay. attendees so, typing. <laughs> well, one thing to say is um, What's occurred to me, Claire, just going listening to that last bit there, is um, uh, if we are maintaining the principle of peer-to-peer -peer learning, at this stage, to pilot the concept, we wouldn't be looking to go to people who are not our peers. So we'd be wanting to pilot this in a professional uh, context. Would you, would you agree with that? I think we should pilot it with, with working people like us before we go, say, into the community, for example. 
Yes, and and yes, what we wanted as as a basic, we want to test out, I suppose, the principles um, and the science, and then how we contextualise that. Yep, yeah, you're right. Can be done by different peer groups. And what we're not doing um, is writing an an eco literacy standard in the way that there's a carbon literacy standard, not yet. That may emerge organically from the interaction with stakeholders like yourselves. Um, but we think of doing that to begin with. But we thought, let's just do a pilot course on this basis, on the Carbon Literacy Foundation, and take it from there. Great in some of the stuff. <laughs> Thanks both. Um, it's Karen Lou here. Um, I'm the uh, Welsh Government policy team leader um, that Claire mentioned. You've renamed us, Claire. I love it. Nature Recovery Team. Oh. I think we should be that rather than Biodiversity Policy Team. It's much better. Um, we're, uh, we're really excited to be um, involved in this and picking up um, and, and hopefully moving this on a bit. Um, while we're waiting for some questions to come in, I was just going to say that this, the reason we pitched up is as part of our biodiversity task force work within Welsh Government, which is about mainstreaming biodiversity um, across Welsh Government, but also looking at um, other approaches we can take to, to take it beyond Welsh Government and obviously learning from, from lots of other areas um, to get this embedded across Government. Um, so I'm I'm happy to help you pick up questions or to leave you to pick up questions as as you want to. There's been a um, couple of come in. Got a volunteer there with Mike Cunningham saying that their subscribers would love to to hear about this. So if that's as a as a pilot group or just to hear more, Mike, um, give us some more information in the in the chat and we download all of these chats. Um, so that we can save them and we can follow up on it later, so we can get back to you on that. Um, and then Len Thank is asking you. if there's any benefit to identifying people's day-to-day -day issues and finding solutions which happen to have benefits uh, for both climate change and um, ecological emergency. Yes, can I speak on that one? Um, yeah. One of the things uh, that I've learned, I did a I did a project within in the Environment Agency, as was then Environment Agency Wales. So we had people, colleagues from there, we had colleagues from Cardiff University, One Voice Wales, Colonel Cymru, and a couple of independent consultants. And we did um, a project on climate change adaptation for local communities. And we went in there several years ago. We went in there thinking, right, we're going to tell you about climate change. Then help you think about it and our big learning from from the project it was a great, big, great project was that um you know go go in with what you what are you trying to do here what who who are you what is this community where are you at where are your aspirations and then try to deal with those uh, i don't say needs but deal with those realities and factor in climate change as either an opportunity or a threat to those realities that people are struggling with. Ditto uh, biodiversity. And I'm sure lots of, I have no idea who's on this call, but I'm sure there's bound to be at least one or two people who have been involved in community level um, ecological activity where it provides skills, where it helps with mental well-being, where it provides food in some cases. So we're not at that level yet. As I said earlier, we want to test this in, in our peer group. But our ambition is that it should become like carbon literacy, and it will get down to that kind of um, of level where I, I specifically refer to teenage mothers on an on a housing estate. But it's not really that flippant because that is there are people uh, across Scotland, for example. There's a there's a well used uh, carbon literacy course for communities in Scotland. So yeah, we, we would like to get get it out to everyone 
that the contextualization is important. The big mistake to make, that most a lot of us would have learned over the years, is don't go in there with a load of graphs. Unless you happen to be talking to people who love graphs, you know, some professional disciplines, they love a good graph, well, fine, but graphs are very expensive. So I just want to stress that it's not about a bunch of university educated scientists parachuting into someone's context and flagging them with information. It's the whole concept of carbon equity and sensitive. So yeah, and that's discover a bit I'm more about your audiences. Sorry, Claire. Yeah, I was going to say that's why the sort of group discussion and group inquiry is so important, and that's a big part of the course. So some of it, um, although it's a day's worth of learning, the way we've adapted um, carbon literacy during lockdown um, has been to sort of do some self-directed study and have these online tutorials and spread it over a week so you have three different sessions across a week and that's actually more manageable for people um so especially in the in the self-directed study then people can find the things that where they want to know more so although this is a, a course you know it's not the only opportunity for learning and um, so we want to point people to learn further but in the group sessions as well it is about it's that discovery for for the learners themselves because we can present people with you know six options of what you could or you should do you know and there will be ten reasons why the person can't do that because their situation will be slightly different and if people identify within their own um, spheres of influence and their own everyday lives the things that they feel they have control over and the things that they would like to change we find that's a much more powerful approach There's quite a lot of questions here about the NHS, um, big drive in green space in the NHS, um, links with health and well-being. Um, so there's um, questions about people who'd be interested to um, pilot that course within the NHS and then questions about where more information can be found. Um, on can that I, as well. So, can I come in on the NHS? And that's brilliant because um, I'm working for Public Health Wales, or Cannell Company is working for Public Health Wales at the moment. Got an ongoing rolling program with them uh, of stuff, and it, uh, stuff will be announced in January. Um, the product of, of the, this work. Um, so, the, through the Public Health Wales Sustainability Hub. I've basically been working with them to develop workshops on environmental responsibility for teams within the NHS and within the public sector. So to pilot this with NHS teams would be just an absolutely coherent, perfect fit and a complement to that work. So I'd be very happy if one of our first pilots with, was with a group of health professionals. Okay, that's great. Thank you. And as I said, we'll we'll make sure that you get all of this information afterwards. Um, there's a comment. There's a few comments about sort of general awareness raising. Um, one about should our education curriculum encompass carbon and eco literacy? I guess the answer is, is yes, but that isn't the aim of this specific course um, on this occasion. No, oh, we're interestingly, um, Melin Holmes, again, another partner of Cannell Cymru, um, well, I should say that there's, there's a con there was a consortium in Manchester of 24 housing associations who all came together to develop carbon literacy training for different professional disciplines within, within, the, within the companies. So peer-to-peer -peer learning, so you know the maintenance teams, the finance and HR teams back office, front of house, all of that. And um, we've replicated that, say we a group of partners, including Connell Cymru, we've replicated that in Wales. We've got 27,000 associations in a consortium. And one of them is uh, Nellyn Holmes, and they're developing carbon literacy for the schools in their Torvine area. So it wouldn't be something that Claire and I would do because of the peer-to-peer -peer principle, but 
what has happened with carbon literacy and could easily happen with this is that we work with people who are developing uh, peer specific or contextualized courses. Uh, so, yeah, if we did it into like a group of teachers, for example, primary school teachers wanted to work with us on it. No, I'm just plucking that out of the air. Anyone really. Um, and I think that Deb Deborah Hill uh, put in the chat, you know, about local context. Yes, yes, definitely. What are the what are the local biodiversity opportunities and challenges that 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 we have to respond to? No, that'll do. Okay. <laughs> Anything you want to come in on that, Claire? I was just reading um, uh, the chat and there's quite a lot about yeah engaging the disengaged which I think mm. is is a really big challenge but you know we're up for it because I don't know with with some of those people if they're if they're professional people well it, it may well be that they you know now we have section six they have a statutory responsibility to to be engaged, so there are some levers, um, and I think it's about finding the levers, the buttons. You know, just finding people's buttons, and we also know that people are much more motivated by their positive emotions. They're much more motivated by love than they are by fear, um, for example. So that would be our preferred route, but that's you know that's something that everybody here um, is working to, uh, you know. Everyone's trying to do that to to engage and just help people experience that um, those wonder moments with with nature. Yeah, I think I think it's a really tough one. We don't have answers yet, but as soon as we have some, we'll be very very happy to share. Just having a look at what's in the chat box there. I just want to clarify something. Um, when I mentioned One Voice Wales, that was about a climate adaptation project of some years ago, and I used to work loads with uh, uh, Pauline, and uh, I have I haven't been working with One Voice Wales for a couple of years, so they're not aware of this initiative. But emerging out of some of the, um, just great to see the enthusiasm that's in the chat. So just to manage expectations. I think I wouldn't expect to dive straight in and pilot this with a community group unless someone wanted to do that with us, someone who was more community orientated in the delivery of their training, if you see what I mean. Uh, where Claire and I would expect to be delivering ourselves would be to the likes of Public Health Wales, NHS, or a Town and Community Council or a group of uh, Town and Community Councillors from various councils via One Voice Wales. So it's that peer-to-peer -peer thing. But say, say one of you out there is, um, has done training for community groups and you are embedded in the community, you're a community officer, you've got that day-to-day -day focus. Yeah, we'd uh, happily sit down with you to try to ensure that the principles of carbon literacy informed course that then you could deliver and you could observe and learn from. And, and the key thing about carbon literacy, about 80% of all carbon literacy courses are pretty much the same, um, more or less. There's 20% of differentiation where you're, where you're taking account of c the learner context um, and the learner locus of control. So, like I said, I've, I've, I've this before and so I forget where I've said things, but especially with Zoom. There's all sitting there and with Zoom. But um it wasn't you, it was someone else. I said um that that should you the debate was should you scare people, right? Because there's a lot of scary stuff in climate change evidence. And the received wisdom is you shouldn't really scare people. But I think that if you're the chief executive of a major public or private sector organization, yes, I should scare you as your trainer. I should really tell you how it is strongly because your locus of control is massive. You could go down the corridor and say, right, I want X, Y, and Z, and I want it by Monday. But if you are a community person or an entire 
there was a volunteer maybe in a in a in a in an ecological project. I don't really want to scare you. I want to tell you that you have uh, the power to do something locally that will make your locality more biodiverse, that will increase you know the, the production in your local. Event Great. There, there are lots of offers here of uh, yeah. yes, piloting groups um, and some resources as well. So, um, and offers to pass information on and a request for your website with information that you can pass around also. So, well, there's a great deal on eco literacy on our website. Isn't it? What about our other work? I don't know. I'm thinking, Claire, as I sit here waffling on, that um, we always knew, didn't we, Claire, that we knew we ought to form a kind of working group. Uh, and we got, we got, at one point we were thinking, well, maybe we form the working group and then we design a course. And then we thought, no, let's just design a course. Let's make a course happen. And there's something real to talk about. Once we've designed the course, we can then combine it with a working group. And I think sitting here and, and looking at the responses that maybe we should be looking to think about people emerging out of today's event as candidates for a working group. What do you think? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're really aware that people People are bombarded um, with invitations to join things, and people's time is very precious, and everybody is very stretched at the moment. But uh, we would, if people are really interested um, in this, we would love to have additional brains, and you know, just just helping, helping sense check things for us, um, and making sure we're on the right track. Like Rodri said, you know, we kind of we. We we know that the the principles and methodology we, we want to apply, and we've seen it work with climate, so we feel it can work with biodiversity as well. But we're not we're not ecologists. We're not. You know, I'm I'm fairly confident that we've got a good understanding, but but obviously not um not as well as people in this audience have. Um, and putting things in the local context, you know, we've got great. Opportunities. Oh, I think Claire might have frozen for a minute. I was um, just going to pick pick that up, but there's a couple of things um, that I can add on that. One is that we have a section six duty um, task and finish group um, that works with public authorities. So we'll we will continue to be working with you on this. Um, but if there's anybody on the in the the call this afternoon, who would be willing to join you on a in a working group? Perhaps you could just add your name to the list. Or just um, stick your hand up, say yes, uh, whatever in the in the chat below, and we can. Um, and you've seen our on pass them on again. There's there's a lot that can um, all over the yes. I think we're probably here here delay from Claire. Um, unless she's back in. Yeah, she might Sorry, be. I disappeared for a bit. I'm back. <laughs> so, so I think we've we've gathered most of the information, I think, from um, an addressed question. If people... Um, oh, great, we're getting some names volunteering. That's lovely. Um, in your absence, Claire, I just asked people to volunteer for to work more closely with you. Um, so, if there's anything else you want to say about that, or we can um, draw to a close and finish a little bit earlier. Just to say, I don't think we need any, um, we got the science covered, right, because well, I'm pretty sure I've got the science covered. I used to, I think a couple of years ago I was lecturing in college on a HMD on ecology. It's more about um, 
the um, it's, to a certain extent it's a kind of educational need a need for educational um, expertise it's about bringing it alive and contextualizing that's that I don't really need anyone to explain to me about trophic cascades or whatever but it's more about um, uh, yeah how we also you make things real as well by providing people with examples and positive inspiration and that's where people can really help us because they they know these things don't make the headlines but because of the Sylvine project for example and because of Claire's work for years in, in environment Wales we know that in every village and community almost is I'm in Radder in Cardiff now we got friends of some wood up there we got the friends of Radder woods and um, we've got people doing little picks on the river there's so many people out there who love nature and who are doing stuff and it's those stories that give people the sense that hey I, I can do something about this it's not just a big tidal wave of despair be active those kind of little stories that we need no, and from what I can see on the, the volunteers that are coming forward, it looks like there's there will be a lot of people who are link have got lots of links with uh, communities, work on the ground, examples of really good work going on, um, and linking up with the community. So I would say it looks like that would be really useful. Fabulous. Thank Any you. final remarks? Well, I haven't got anything to say yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, in that case, I would thank you both very much for your um, presentation. That was really interesting. Um, I really liked the the wicked um, problems there, Rodri. That yes, absolutely the the issue, isn't it? Um, and as I said earlier, we're really looking forward to um, to seeing how this goes and, and piloting it and then hopefully rolling it out much wider. So, um, so thank you both for that. And thank you to everybody uh, on the call who's been listening and contributing. Um, as I said, we will collect all that information and share it with Rodri and Claire. Um, so they may be contacting you um, outside of this meeting. Um, and before I finish... Oh. Sorry. Oh, one, last one, thing la one last stupid thing occurred to me is that it may not be called eco literacy, right? So there's a bit of dispute about what it gets ends up being called. But, uh, That's fine. Yeah. Okay. So maybe you should have a rename the course. You've renamed my team, so you can rename your course. So <laughs> we'll do that. <laughs> Um, so just before we finish, just to say thank you to everybody on the call, um, just a reminder um, that there's lots more information on the Hoover platform for the conference. Um, you can provide feedback on the sessions, you can book your next sessions, and one last reminder that there is a social networking quiz tonight at 6 o'clock, um, which if you're interested, we would love to see you there. That would, um, looking forward to to a bit of light-hearted entertainment. Um, thank you all very much for today's um, attendance. If you've been here since 9 o'clock this morning, I commend you, I salute you. That is pretty good going. Um, and we, as I say, so far um, the conference has been going really well and we're really pleased with, with the level of attendance and the, and the talks and the presentations we've been having. So thank you all very much and we'll see you again tomorrow at nine o'clock for the State of Mammals launch.